Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we both welcome you back to The New World Next Week, and this is the 200th episode of The New World Next Week. And in lieu of bells and whistles and special super extravaganza episodes, let's just have a episode 200 America seems to be completely falling apart episode. And we'll begin with the story that we must begin with. Activists say outside agitators to blame for Ferguson violence. As darkness fell on Ferguson, Missouri, the crowd of several hundred people protesting the fatal police shooting of an unarmed black teen quickly and radically changed. The crowd shrunk as many of the older people slipped away. Protest hymns were replaced by shouts of angry teens who marched against a cordon of heavy, heavily armed police blocking the street. By the end of another night of violence, dozens had been arrested, marking the latest outbreak of rancor in the St. Louis suburb where calls for peaceful protests have been overshadowed by episodes of looting, arson, and clashes with police over the last now 10 plus days. Some perpetrators have made no efforts to hide their faces. Others have charged into stores bare-chested with shirts wrapped over their faces and baseball caps pulled over their brows. Civil rights leaders and police at odds over much over much of what has occurred in this small, mostly black St. Louis suburb. They all agree on at least one hypothesis. Many of the perpetrators are not local residents. At times, the most violent element hide in the alleys, emerging to throw rocks or bottles before disappearing again, others caught and taken into custody. After this past Monday's violence, 56 were arrested overnight, most on a charge of failure to disperse as the curfew kicked in. This, according to St. Louis County Justice Services Center, it said 15 were from outside Missouri, but some of the most serious charges came from folks that were local. Since a white police officer killed an unarmed black teenager, Michael Brown, on August 9th. Police have struggled to contain outbursts of violence, even as highway patrol officers and National Guard troops have been deployed. Quote, I've said that many a criminal element that have been coming through Ferguson are not from this area. Tonight, some of those arrested came from as far away as New York and California. End quote. State Highway Patrol Captain Ron Johnson told a news conference following Monday's protest. Whoever is behind the violence... Local and civil rights leaders seemed unable, again, to fully control the most violent elements in the crowd. At the Missouri, as the Missouri, rather, Highway Patrol, which has been put in charge of security on site, rolled out noise cannons intended to drive demonstrators back. A handful of area preachers appealed to the crowd to heed their orders. God told us in the Bible to obey the law of the land, said Elder Jimmy Birchfield of St. Louis City who had come out in hopes of helping to calm the situation. When we make a mistake and we have to be arrested, we have to be arrested. James, that's a long story to tell, I think, but a very important one. If you followed the work that you and I have been doing in now these five years and 200 episodes of New World Next Week and our own episodes now stretching back nearly 10 years we've been doing this kind of work, this story contains every element of everything we've ever tried to kind of sound the warning about, James, from from sound cannons to preachers telling people to give up, this is frightening. It really is. And as you say, this is the culmination of so many different stories that we've covered over the years. People have to understand this is just one data point in a much, much bigger picture that goes back. I mean, we can go back at least to the Battle of Seattle and the Black Bloc being brought in and harbored there as a way of disrupting what was going on there and giving the police an excuse to crack down. And we've seen that exact same strategy used time and time again at protests in, in Canada, in uh, London, in, uh, in Pittsburgh, at the G20 in Toronto at the G20, again and again and again, these outside protesters in masks and uh, and black uniforms come, come in and perpetrate some violence and suddenly they're gone and all of a sudden the police have the big excuse to crack down. And the worst part about this is that it continues to be an effective strategy. And I think the strategy here that the social engineers are clearly trying for with Ferguson is to roll out the police state, the militarized police state, in a way that the public will not only accept it, it, but actually clamor for it, embrace it willingly, lovingly, uh, take it in their arms and, and swaddle it. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what's happening 
with a large section of the population that this wedge that's being driven down uh, by between the people and trying to put the people um, at each other's throats is unfortunately being effective. I'm sure we've all seen it in the comment sections of various stories talking about what's happening in Ferguson. Oh, well, it's the looters. It's the looters' fault. And, you know, it's, it's all their fault. And, and it's a good thing this is happening. Trust me, I guarantee you it is not a good thing that the militarized police state is being rolled out. These are the people, the combat troops that are being deployed on the streets of the United States right now who will be the ones to take you away to the FEMA camps when and if that, that day comes. And uh, you will be regretting uh, being behind this militarized police state when and if that day comes. Whatever problems exist between people at the bottom of this pyramid is nothing compared to the, the problems that exist between all of us at the bottom and those very few at the top of the pyramid. And we have to keep our eye on that struggle and stop being divided against each other in these petty power politics games um, for scraps from the master's table. There is a much, much bigger game that's going on here. And the billions of dollars that the DHS has been providing to militarized police uh, departments throughout the country for the last decade, at least, is coming to fruition here. They're rolling it out. This is PR for the, the police state, and we have to resist it and, uh, and keep our eyes on what the real situation is and stop fighting with each other. James, it'll be impossible to kind of include a blow by blow kind of situation of of Ferguson. We'll include related links, but I think one of if there's any kind of positives to be gleaned out of this, one of them has been pretty much as you were saying across the board, mass amounts of folks noticing and asking the question, "Hey, why did our cops get all this military equipment?" I think they're all suddenly realizing what's been going on for a long time, and it's not just this puppet; it's the previous puppet, and it's, and it's all of those guys. So we will include those related links. James, let's move now to our second story. Amid the California drought, some call their plans to pump desert water a Ponzi scheme. California has approved water rights agreements for a whopping five times as much water as it actually has. This according to a brand new study published in Environmental Research Letters. In fact, the State Water Resources Control Board, which manages the allocation of water rights to various agencies and districts, has been over-promising water rights for the last 100 years. In some cases, there's a tenfold difference between the amount of water allocated and the genuine water flow in the state. Needless to say, this may lead to serious problems if the state's record-breaking droughts continue, or worse, intensify with climate change. That's what the study's two authors, Joshua Veers and Theodore Grantham, recommend a drastic overhaul of the water rights system with improved accuracy and accountability. Quote, given the public's current attention on drought and California water, we now have an unprecedented opportunity for strengthening the water rights system, said Grantham, a U.S. geological survey science scientist in a UC Davis statement. The other writer Joshua Veers, a professor at UC Merced, says it gives the public a false sense of water security. It's like standing in line to get into a concert and they give you a ticket when they're already at capacity, but you don't know that you'll never actually get in to see the show. It's also kind of like a Ponzi scheme, James. Only in place of imaginary money, you have inflated amounts of the most fundamental agreement ingredient rather for all life on earth if people were pissed about losing their investments to bernie madoff they will be justifiably irate over having phony water rights james this story comes from vice's motherboard blog and even as i was just covering the story this is essentially almost the storyline of chinatown but leaving that aside this water war as well the related story that we see going on in detroit james is another situation of something that's been warned about, that's been seen, and in this case you can see has been going on for a hundred years, but has now only finally reached the front page. James. I, it is now reaching the front page, but I think this is a worrying sign of a larger trend that's developing, and one that's been noted by people like Dr. Tim Ball, who I had on the program, I, I believe, two years ago now to talk about this. He's written several articles. I'll link one up in the show notes. Water is replacing climate as the next false UN environmental re resource scare, talking about this idea of peak water that's being seeded into the 
population right now. And we're seeing how this plays out economically, because, of course, this is big business for certain uh, players, including, of course, the states that get to assign water rights to, to companies. They can sell out, uh, you know, like derivatives, hundreds of times of what, what they actually don't have. And uh, and the uh, I, this is being propagated on a scare that is taking place right now about uh, water, drinkable, usable water, that uh, that is being promulgated by the same UNEP that was responsible, the United Nations Environment Program, that was responsible for Agenda 21, that was responsible for the IPCC, that is uh, responsible for the current international decade for action, Water for Life, which you probably didn't know was going on, but is going on from 2005 to 2015. It's, it's again, part of a much bigger agenda that's happening, and um, unfortunately, this is going to be one of the ways that they try to continue the, the never-ending environmental scare that is always used to try to monopolize resources and drive up the the value of those resources for economic interests and not yours or my economic interests, the economic interests of the people who control those resources. So again, this is uh, just another small part of a bigger worrying trend. And that's not to say that droughts don't happen, but of course, uh, droughts are always happening in different parts of the ecosystem. And that's why it's called a water cycle, because the water doesn't disappear. It uh, it goes from one area to another. And so uh, I'll again, I'll invite you to take a look at that link where he talks more about the scientific basis of, of this. But uh, I think, again, we have to have our thinking caps on and be very wary of who gets to control our water resources and um, how we pay for them, because ultimately this is going to be uh, an increasingly important issue for the, uh, the coming years. So I just kind of mentioned what's going on in, in Detroit, but basically their water and sewage department has been turning off utilities for delinquent or overdue accounts since early on this year. This shutoff campaign has actually garnered international press attention and has been called a, quote, affront to human rights by who, James? Representatives of the United Nations. So we'll include those UNEP links, which ties in quite well with that. And also, actually, I was just reminded of a situation that played out in Toledo, Ohio, another sort of water scare story. We've seen a lot of these here in Portland, that our m most treasured resource actually seems to be the one that's most under attack, whether it's by local officials that want to put fluoride in it or outside multinational corporations like Nestle who want to come and bottle and steal all the water. So having said that and having referenced Portland, Oregon, where I come to you right now, our third and final story this week was actually suggested over on the Facebook page. Jennifer in Decatur, Alabama, said she'd love to see this story on New World Next Week, and she noted that this headline almost read like a threat. Do not buy list could leave Portland with no options for corporate investment. Portland is moving forward with City Commissioner Steve Novick's plan to stop the city from investing its $940 million portfolio in companies that are ethically challenged. But the group that guides the portfolio warns this do-not-buy list could leave the city with few corporations left to invest in. Novick drew national media attention in May when the city started implementing his plan to dump its $36 million investment in Walmart bonds. Last week, the city council took the step toward creating a do-not-buy list based on how companies treat their employees, the environment, and public health. The city council on August 6th approved recommendations from a group studying how to start socially responsible investing. The plan has alarmed the city's Investment Advisory Committee, the IAC, which guides the city's portfolio. In May, they wrote a letter saying that this list could grow so long, a list of bad companies could grow so large, it would leave the city with no options for corporate investment, saying, quote, in this letter, May 23rd, scoring may prove to be difficult as companies may align well with certain principles, but not with others. For example, Walmart has an excellent environmental record, but a poor record with respect to labor and business practices. As such, the do not buy list might possibly include the city's entire list of eligible insurers. They also warned this could be a ripple effect and could also affect Portland government. If the city's bottom line is reduced to reduced portfolio earnings, the services the public may need to be services to the public may need to be reduced. The public might feel that this is a good thing in the beginning, but when their services start to be affected, it may cause great discontent and anger within the city. Novick says he's going to go forward with a plan, but be careful about how big the list gets. And he says we're not going to put every company on the do not buy list, noting 
Coke is by definition damaging to human health, but I would not suggest putting them on the list unless I saw evidence that they violated other criteria. So that's a funny note. It's like, no, Coke's actual product is damaging, but that's what they do. So it's so it's cool. James, this is a city here, Portland, Oregon, whose lifeblood is pumped by Nike, Microsoft, Intel, Columbia Sportswear, and a ton of other big-time multinational slave labor BS corporations. So the IEC actually makes a really interesting point, though maybe not the way in which they intended, and I would just put out to folks there, and we had this conversation at home, our city invests millions of dollars in Walmart? Interesting bit of homework for folks out there might be to find out what their city is investing in and maybe contact their own city council. James? This is such an important issue, and there's a couple of points to be made. One, yes, this is just a transparent threat, isn't it? Well, you might think it's okay at first if we just cut down on resources and on on investments a little bit, but but, but then you won't like it when we cut down on your services, will you? You won't like it when we turn off the the spigot and stop uh, stop providing you with transportation, right? I don't know who I'm uh, trying to parody there, but it's just ridiculous on its face. And the second part is, I mean, how sad an indictment of it of our society is it that the only part profitable ventures that people can invest in are companies that in some way or another are raping some you know some uh, underprivileged group somewhere in the world i mean that's that's pretty much what we're reduced to and it's uh it's something that i'm constantly brushing up against because i write for the international forecaster newsletter i'm on a bunch of programs every week talking about uh, f- uh, finance and investment and that type of thing uh, it's always been my stance. It's pretty easy to make money if that's all you're interested in. Just go invest in the military industrial complex or one of these big multinational slave labor companies. Hey, you'll make money hand over fist. I, I have no doubt about it. Um, but that shouldn't really be the point, should it? And uh, and we have to find other ways to build up local economies. Can you imagine if the city of Portland invested in local businesses rather than big multinationals? I mean, I, that could actually change the nature of the city itself so that uh, it, it becomes more of a self-sufficient community. But uh, that's, I'm sure, not something that's even on the radar of these people who, again, I think are just threatening um, what could happen if you make us stop di- uh, start divesting ourselves of these bad, uh, bad um, investments. Again, it's just a ridiculous st- uh, statement. So, again, I think you are hitting the nail on the head. I, ho- I hope everybody out there is looking into what does your community invest in and, and uh, what can you do to bring pressure on them about those investments. So, James, I think to wrap up this 200th episode, and again, it's, I don't have the time to thank the folks out there who have made this so worthwhile over the years. And, James, of course, it's been my pleasure to work with you for 200 episodes, hopefully 200 plus more. And we'll get back to our regularly scheduled deprogramming very soon. And we thank the folks out there for kind of sticking with us through the summer. We've been off and on hiatuses and vacations and computers breaking and all those things that we all have to deal with in this world. But we'll continue to bring you the news. If you guys as well continue to submit stories to us on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week, James. I can't believe it's been five years and 200 episodes. It's been an incredible ride so far, James. Um, I'm looking forward to five more years at least, and uh, pro- hopefully five years from now we'll we'll have nothing to talk about because it'll all be good news. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how the world develops. Thank you again for all your time and effort and energy and work, and to everyone out there who supported this, uh, this broadcast all the time. Um, thank you so much for your, your guys' support as well. Thanks so much. Take care.